Let's pray as we get into scripture this morning. Father, we want to read your, your word, and we want it to speak to us. We want your scriptures to tell us what to believe and how to live. I pray for open hearts, open minds as we look at your word this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Strongly agree, agree, undecided, disagree, or strongly disagree. All right, ready? Just a little random survey. I believe that all fast food should be eaten in the restaurant. Where are you at? Okay. You, you're a car person? I, dude, when I go to a fast food restaurant, there's going to be a large tub of ketchup, sweet and sour, and hot mustard sauce. Large. It is a lot of ketchup. We consume. We mop up the ketchup. So it has to be eaten in the restaurant. Cars, restaurant. Where do you eat it? Okay, how about this? I believe that ultimate Frisbee should be an Olympic sport. You disagree. Well, you, you come over on September 9th and you watch the blood, sweat, and tears that are shed on Huffman Street safely. Uh, and it's an Olympic sport. Uh, those are some things. This is just silly things. But how about this? I believe in God. Where are you at? I believe in God. How about I believe God is alive and working in the universe today? Yeah? Is he here? How about this? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the gift that he paid on the cross for my sins when he died and rose again brings about salvation. Yeah? Can I get an amen on that? What, what do we believe? What about, what about creation? What do you believe about creation? Maybe the most controversial verse in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, what do you have to say about that? Do we agree, or is that one up for debate? Uh, this past week, I saw a video. Um, it's been gaining some, some, some traction on the Internet. It's been out for about a week now. It was, it was released by Bill Nye. If you remember Bill Nye, the science guy, yeah, there he is. Uh, if, you, if you search it, it's, it's pretty popular. He's got over 3.5 million views just in one week. Um, but he released this video called uh, Creationism is Not Appropriate for Children. I thought, okay, that hits kind of close to home since I have kids and we'd like to teach them that God created the heavens and the earth. So I thought, let's see what it has to say. Let's see what Bill Nye has to say, this science whiz has to say about creation. And so I wrote down a couple of things uh, from his, his video. You can search it up and, and watch it later. Uh, but I just want to share a couple of things that he said. Uh, when you have a portion of the population that doesn't believe in evolution, that would be us creationists, it holds everyone back. Really, evolution is the fundamental idea in all of life science, in all of biology. So once in a while, I get people, I meet them that claim that they don't believe in evolution. And my response generally is, really, why not? Your world, listen to this, your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. We'll talk about that in a second, okay? Because I was like, really fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. I mean, here are ancient dinosaur bones or fossils, radioactivity, distant stars, just like our stars. Uh, the idea of deep time, billions of years, explains so much of the world around us. If you try to ignore that, your worldview becomes crazy, weak, shaky, and inconsistent. And so I say to grown-ups, to parents, to me, if you want to deny evolution and live in your world, that's fine, but don't make your kids do it. Okay, that's, that's like, okay, now at this point I'm really mad. Don't make your kids do it because we need them. We need scientific literate voters and taxpayers for the future. We need engineers that can build stuff and solve problems. Okay, you, if you have a child and you believe in creation, you should be annoyed now. Uh, and he ends it with this. You know, and it seems kind of like he's okay. Uh, in, in another couple of centuries, that worldview, creationism, the biblical account of God creating the heavens and the earth, in a couple of centuries, I'm sure it just won't exist. There's no evidence for it. At that point, I'm, I, I'm, I'm clicking the unlike button for sure. I'm like, this is, I don't agree with this at all. That's not what I believe. If I was back to the strongly disagree, I would push that button. That's where I'd be in what he had to say. And so what do we believe? What does the Bible have to say about creation? What would our biblical response be to that? I'm excited. We've got small groups starting up this week, and we, I really want to see all of us get involved in a small group. And so there's lots of different times throughout the week for you to get involved uh, in a small group. Great opportunity for us to, to learn more, to discuss, to get into the scriptures and look at what um, 
God's word has to say. And so let's jump into creationism today. And so there's, there's basically five worldviews that try to explain creation. Uh, and I believe Bayard Taylor, uh, he's an author, he does a pretty good job of, of summing these up. Now, these are not titles that he's created, uh, but they do a pretty good job of, of putting a category to some of the five different creation worldviews. And so if you've got your sermon outlines, you've got a pen, you're going to start filling these in. And so the first one is Young Earth Creationist. Young Earth Creationist. And I believe we probably have a lot of us in this room that are young earth creationists. And I'm going to try to go through this as objectively as I can, but you'll see my bias. You'll see the truth. Uh, either way. Uh, so young earth creationists. These uh, believers uh, would say that God made the world in six literal days. Six 24-hour days, God created the world. Uh, they believe that uh, first day, light and darkness. Second day, sky and water. Third day, land, sea. Fourth day, sun, moon, and stars. Fifth day, fish, birds. Sixth day, animals and humans, and the seventh day, he rested. That's a lot of stuff. He's got to take a day off. It's appropriate. And so uh, young earth creationists, uh, they believe in microevolution, but not macroevolution, in small changes within a species. So for example, the house sparrow here in America. The house sparrows in the north are larger than the house sparrows in the south. Why is that? Well, in the north, it gets colder. And so skinny little birds and they get cold, so they fly south. The big birds, they stay warm, so they stay there. The skinny birds in the south, hey, it doesn't get cold. And so you have skinny, small, and large birds north and south. Uh, so just examples, I was talking to Kevin about this, and he said that's, that's what we believe. In, in science, we see microevolution, we see small changes. We don't see drastic, uh, I'm in the water, I'm on land. Lung to, to, to gill, it, it doesn't happen. Uh, so microevolution, yes. This is an interesting one. This is one, this is not today's sermon. But this is one you could discuss on the way home. Young earth creationists don't believe death occurred until the fall of sin. That's important. Think about that. Did people die before uh, uh, sin came in? You know, once sin came in, then there was, there was spiritual death. But was there physical death beforehand? And so young earth creationists would say, no. Nobody died. Nothing died before and so that's an interesting one to, to think about. When did death occur? Is it, is it a separation between physical death and spiritual death? Or are they both the same? So that's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, old earth creationists. Old earth creationists. Uh, as we go through these lists, you're going to notice that there's, there's a, a level of authority that Scripture is given. And as we go down the list, that, that authority seems to be removed, seems to be undermined. Okay, and, and yes, the old earth creationists would say, we're not undermining scripture. We hold scripture to the highest level of change. I, I, it's my bias, okay? Put me in the top category. Young earth creationists, they would go to the Genesis account and they would say that the word day, when God says he created in one day, they would translate that word as age or time period. And so the Hebrew word there, they would say, God doesn't really mean a day. He means a time period, maybe a couple billion years. You know, like, this day seems like it's going on forever. Um, it's a horrible example. But they would say that it, it, it uh, is a metaphor, and it's leading towards that. And so instead of saying God created it in six days, they'd say mm, 4.6 billion years, 15 billion years for the universe. Either way, God made it. It just took him a lot longer. Okay, so old earth creationists. They, uh, death existed prior to the fall. I mean, there's no way that you could live that long. And so man had died prior to the spiritual fall. Uh, they also accept microevolution, but reject macroevolution. So old earth creationist. Intelligent design. Now, I have a lot of respect for intelligent design because they, they get close. They're still walking away from the scriptures, but they get close to, to looking for something. Intelligent design believes uh, because there is irreducible complexity in biological systems, something had to make this. Irreducible, irreducible complexity. You look at what the world has, and you say, this can't be an accident. You look at your eye. You look at life. You hear the little ones making noise. It's beautiful. Keep them here. But like my kids, I look at my kids, and I think, this is an accident. You're an accident. No, no, they're not. They're created by, the, by God. And I would never call them an accident. That's horrible. Um, but your uh, intelligent design says, we, we look around and, and they would agree with Psalms 19, 1, where it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim uh, the works of his hands. They look in, in nature and they say, something had to make this. 
uh, they, they would agree that disorder never creates order, that accident and just time and chance will eventually improve itself, okay? I, I have kids. I know what their rooms look like. I've never walked in and been like, whoa, everything's put away. Amazing. That's never going to happen. It never will. You, you let me know if your house changes, okay? If it's disorder, it will just continue to become more disorder. Uh, but intelligent design uh, holds on to the belief that irreducible complexity, we can't take evolution, something had to make it. And then we keep going. Theistic evolution, theistic evolution. These believers would say, somebody uh, created it and somebody evolved it, and we'll give that somebody, so we'll, we'll say it's God. Theistic, Theo, uh, God, God started it, he started the bang, and then he let it all evolve from there. And so they try to take the Bible and science and mesh them together. Uh, uh, theistic evolutions would also say that the Genesis 1 and 2 account are more focused on the who, God creating it, and not on the what and the how. And so theistic evolution. And then the last one, the naturalistic evolution. Naturalistic evolution, they just believe it's just nature, and that's it. You just take chance, time, and matter, and you get an earth and a universe, and you just wait billions and billions and billions and billions of years, and here we are, and that's how it happens. I have a problem with naturalistic evolution, because if we accept that as our worldview for creation, then we're a giant accident, a giant cosmic accident, and, and that's it. I mean, if we're an accident, then who determines truth? Who determines right and wrong? Why are we here? What's the purpose? There's more things that, uh, as I was going through the Bob Russell, the small group thing, I'll just give you a quick glimpse at it. It's pretty exciting. Um, he says, three things that I disagree with for evolution. Nothing to matter. Nothing is always nothing. Okay? I have several bank accounts. They've been nothing. They will continue to be nothing. Nothing be, never becomes anything. Okay? That's just how it works. Nothing to matter. Matter to life. It's dirt. Unless God breathes in it, it's going to continue to be dirt. And then life to man. How can we move from those? Those are huge jumps that, as a believer, I have to reject. And so uh, uh, I appreciate what Jason was saying. You were saying this beforehand. He said, if, if evolution, if naturalistic evolution really existed, then why haven't we evolved like some really cool stuff, like some antlers? Like, he, he, yeah, you know, that'd be cool. Or maybe some of you mothers, especially some of you mothers with twins, why don't you have extra arms, you know? Or the ability to not sleep. You know, come on, like, why aren't we evolving to this? But that's not happening because that's not the way we're made and it's not where we're at. And so let's get into this. But before we get into looking at Genesis, flip your Bibles, go to the back. I want you to go to 2 Timothy, all the way to the back, 2 Timothy. It's on page 965 if you've got a church Bible. 2 Timothy, verse 3, chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 16. Because before we go to Genesis, we have to establish this as the foundation for what we're looking at in scriptures today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this, all scripture is God-breathed. Those five words there. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, everything. So if we go back to our survey at the beginning, do you agree, strongly agree, undecided, or disagree? How much of this do we believe in? I believe that all of this is in God's inspired word, or maybe some has accidental typos. Go over to um, 2 Peter, a couple pages over, 984. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. So if all scripture is God-breathed, then it's not man-made. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says this. I'm waiting. I love the pages turning. That's good. Open your Bibles, turn your pages. That's appropriate. Chapter 1, verse 21. For prophecy never had its origin in human will. Prophecy, scriptures, this. It's not man-made. It didn't start in the human will. But prophets, though human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the writers of the scriptures did not just sit around and think, hey, let's write a book of the Bible today. No, the Holy Spirit came into their life and divinely guided them to write the, the scriptures, to write the truth 
that we have. And so when I look at this and I say all scripture is God breathed, God wrote all of this, this is true. I, I believe that 100% without a shadow of a doubt. This is God's inspired word and I believe all of it. Amen. And I'm glad. I'm so glad that we have truth. I'm so glad that we have absolute truth. We all want truth. We like truth. Let me give you an example. This past yesterday, this past yesterday, uh, I was at a little 5K run walk. Now, this is the first run walk I've done. I've done 5K runs before, uh, but I've never done a run walk. And so I did my run, and, and my wife was doing the walk. All right? And as I'm doing my run, uh, I'm going, and there was people in front of me. There were a lot of people in front of me, but that's regardless. Uh, they're going, and I'm watching them run. And they're, and they're, they're doing a really, really good job. They're, they're filled with integrity the way they're running this course because it's through these little towns. And so we're weaving in and out of streets and cars, First race I've ever dodged automobiles that are moving. Not safe. Um, but there's every corner that you come to. Okay, so there's the stop sign, and we're supposed to go around the corner. Not a single racer in front of me cut the corner off. They all went around the corner. I thought, there's nobody here stopping them. We could all just cut through the grass, cut through somebody's yard, make the, give us an advantage, but none of them did. I remember in soccer practice, people cut the flag all the time. I always chopping the corners because it's easier that way. Nobody cheated. Appropriate. So we finished the race, finished the race, and I'm going back to find my wife. So I, I get done, and then I'm going back to find her to finish the walkout with her. And as I'm walking back, I'm seeing everybody fin coming towards the, the, the finish line, and there's this guy, and I guess he's like a competitive walker. I've never seen one of these before. But he's got this, like, this, these hips. It's crazy. I'm not going to do that again. It's embarrassing. But this guy is cooking. I looked at his time. He's walking at six miles per hour. Most of us, that's how fast we run, okay? This guy's just walking as fast as he can. I'm thinking, it's going to kill your back. Anyways, he's, he's, he's cooking, he's flying, and I'm seeing all these people coming towards the finish line. And races are cool. I don't know if you've ever done one of these. Um, if you haven't, Brad Monis has the soldiers, the heroes run coming up in two weeks. And so see Brad, we're going to go, I'm going to run 15K, maybe. I might walk some. Anyways, so all these people are coming, and there's people of all age groups, and so as these people are coming towards the finish line, I see people that are 50, 60, 70. I got beat by one of them in the race, in the run. I'm thinking, you're 60. How do you beat me? But whatever. But there's these little old ladies that are just cooking down the path. And, and I find my wife, and we're walking towards her. And then they have the, the, the ceremony where they're giving out the awards. And they're, they're calling out everybody for the walkers. And, of course, the swishy hips guys, he gets first place. But then they bring up this 20-something-year-old lady, and she gets second place for the, for the walk. And I stood there and I thought, wait a minute, I saw you walking and you were running. And they clearly specified at the beginning of the race, if you're a walker, you walk. If you're a runner, you can run. If you want to do both, then you enter the running category. And I thought, you cheated. And then I looked at the third place lady, just some 65-year-old grandma who was cooking it, but she doesn't get a trophy because the cheater took it. I'm ticked. I'm like, okay, this is an injustice, and I'm ready to talk, and my wife is slapping her hand over my mouth. I'm like, get out of the way. This is not fair. <laughs> Can you change truth? You can't change truth. What if that lady wanted to redetermine the difference between a walk and a run? Does she get to do that? Well, she did. Is that fair? I don't think it's fair. All through history, we try to change truth. We say marriage doesn't really need to be defined as a man and a woman. We can change that. We define when life starts. Really? Do we get to call that? Or is that God's decision? See, I am so thankful that there is absolute truth in this world, that right and wrong exists, and that God set the standard. See, absolute truth proves that we have a creator. I look at absolute truth and I say, because God created the world, he created truth with it. There's a purpose to, to why. There's, there's truth. There are, there are things that will always be right and things that will always be wrong. And so who gets to determine truth? God. Where did he determine it? In his scriptures. And why? Because he made the universe. And if you have a problem with that, then you can make your own universe and you can set your own truth. But until then, we're living in his universe, and he said absolute truth, and we all want absolute truth. We desire it, so let's submit ourselves to him. So I see absolute truth as an existence, a proof that God exists. There's more. Let's go over to Genesis. Flip your Bibles. 
Go to Genesis chapter 1. All the way at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. See, when you talk about evolution, naturalistic evolution, and that we're just a cosmic accident, and that there's no meaning, it's just survival of the fittest, and whoever votes the most and the loudest gets to be right, and I, I can't, I can't take that. There has to be truth. There has to be something that sets that standard. And so we look over at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 26 and 27. Then God said, God's creating everything, and he says here in verse 26, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, and over all the creatures and, that move along the ground. 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God made us. God created us in his image. There's something unique, something intrinsically valuable about who we are. We're different than animals. There's something eternally different about us. We have a soul. We were created in the image of God. We will live after this life here. We will spend an eternity in heaven or in hell. I can't believe that we evolved from monkeys because if we did, then monkeys would be created in the image of God. And if they're created in the image of God, then whatever came from them, and, and we back it all the way up from, from goo to zoo, wait, from goo to you in the form of a zoo, then everybody's created in the image of God. But the scriptures say that we're unique. And so I look at Genesis, and I look at the fact that we're created in the image of God and say, theistic evolution, I can't believe it. We're different than the rest of, of life. I look at naturalistic evolution and say, I can't buy into that. We're different from that. Flip over to Genesis chapter 1, go up to verse 9. Go up to verse 9. Turn the page back here. Do a little Hebrew word study here. Verse 9, the first day, or excuse me, the, the, um, the third day here. Chapter 1, verse 9. And God said, let the water, excuse me, that's the wrong verse, I apologize. I meant to say verse 5. Verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. The first day, this word yam, this Hebrew word for day, that the older creationists would say, that can mean time period. As we look through Genesis, there's 357 times where this word is used, and it's used as a day, as one 24-hour period. So if we look through the whole book of Genesis, and every time yam is used, it's a day, it's a day, it's 24 hours, it's 24 hours. Why would we come to Genesis chapter 1 and say, let's change it? Why would we do that? Is that because we want to, or is that because Scripture changed? No, I think it's because we, let me rephrase that, some wanted to change Scripture. If God says he did it in a day, then he did it in a day. You look over in Genesis chapter 30, 36, and it says, then he put three-day journey between himself and Jacob. Is that three days or three billion days? Like, how many, how many times are we going to change Yom from day to infinite amount of time? God said he did it in a day. He did it in a day. And you look through these. Every day it ends with this. Verse 5. There was evening and there was morning. Go down to verse 8. God called the vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Go down to verse 13. And there was evening and there was morning. Go down to verse 19 if you'd like another one. And there was evening and there was morning. After every day that God creates, he ends it with there was evening and there was morning. Again, Hebrew word study. Does that really mean 24 hours? Or does that mean time period? You look over in Exodus and it says, the next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge of the people and they stood around him from morning till evening. Is that one day or is that a billion years? I think it's one day. Why do we change it? And so we look at the Hebrew in this context here. God created it six days. God created the world six days. Then we look at science. Just one quick example. Dave Fowler is an expert in creationism, and so if you'd like to pick his brain, he's over there. Kevin's really smart too, but he wanted me to point at Dave. Um, the receding moon. I, I, I'm not a scientist, but I will try my best. The receding moon. The gravitational pull between Earth and the moon causes the Earth's oceans to have tides. The tidal friction between the Earth's terrestrial surface and the water moving over it causes energy to be added to the moon. This results in a constant yearly increase in the distance between the earth and the moon. In other words, 
the moon is going away from us at four centimeters a year. Not a big deal. Four centimeters, like an inch and a half, a big deal. But what happens if we back up in time? It gets closer and closer and closer and closer. And at what point does it hit the earth? At what point does it mess up all the oceans? At what point is the tide just totally destroyed because the moon is too close? It's about 750 million years they would have been touching. Now you think, I thought you said the earth was only 6,000 years old. Correct. But 750 million is still much less than 15 billion. I mean, we're talking just gigantic numbers here. The moon is moving. Who created it? I think God did. And he started it there. That's the way it is. There was a period in my life where I was studying this a couple years ago. And I came home and I said to my wife, I said, have you ever heard about old earth creationism? I said, I've never heard this. I said, this is really interesting stuff. I said, I think I might be, might be changing from a young earth creationist to an old earth creationist. That was not a good conversation. There was some tension. There were some tears. And I remember this. I remember looking at me and she goes, if that's going to change, what else are you going to stop believing? That's that would, that hit home. If I'm going to not listen to Genesis 1 and 2, 1 and 2, what else am I not going to believe in? The scriptures are filled with miracles, filled with times where God comes into the world and changes things. There's a donkey that talks in the book of Numbers. It's crazy. It happens. Read your Bible, you'll see it. There's an axe head that floats. There's a day that stands still. There's fire that comes from the sky and eats dirt and ground and rocks and altars and some pretty crazy things in the Bible because God's doing things here in this world. There's a son that was born to Mary and Joseph that lived and gave his life on the cross to die, to be dead for three days, to come again, to go back to heaven and to give us free life through salvation. Has that ever happened again? Can we, can we quantify that? Can we test that? Can we prove that? Can we do that again? I'm sorry, that happened once. You better not miss it. I believe this. I believe this is God's inspired word. And so if God said it, then I believe it, and that's it. Call me simple-minded, but I know when I leave this earth, I'm going to heaven. And when I'm here, I look at this, I read this, and I say, this is what I believe, and I stand in awe of the mighty works of what God did. I look at this world, and I, I, I'm with the intelligent design. Look at the irreducible complexity. Look at how we've been made. Look at that life you're holding. And you, you say there's no God? I say there is a God. He's alive, and I worship him. Father, we thank you for giving, for creating, for making, and for loving. And we pray that we can live a life of worship that respects and honors you, that submits our will and says, I will follow you. We love you so much and we thank you for everything you've blessed us with. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen.